I'm going to take you on a journey with the two most reviled creatures in Africa, lions and elephants. For me, it's about them being so rooted to the earth, but being so spiritual at the same time. But they're disappearing. They're collapsing. This is genocide. We brought you here to talk about wild things. Two creatures we really love, lions and elephants. But if you're an African and you have an elephant in your garden, it's pretty problematic. But we, we want to help Africa save these creatures. The central part of this evening is this book that we're just coming out with here. In Earth to Sky, you'll see what I'm getting at with that title as we go. In 1991, I went to Central African Republic, and I was hooked up by the National Geographic with a man named Mike Fay. And we would go to this clearing. It's called the Zangabai, and it's, a, it's the mecca for forest elephants. And forest elephants are hunted throughout their range. They always have been. They are still hunted. So all of my experiences were with elephants for the next 15 years are elephants that are afraid of them. Get back. That's the clearing. Now, the, the operative thing here is this is the mecca for forest elephants. Well, what's going to happen in this story is here in 2013, that is an ivory dump. And the rebels that just invaded killed 50 of those elephants because you can now fund your insurgency with ivory that is so valuable. So Mike says, look, Nick, I've found a place in Chad where there's herds of 1,000 elephants. So we go to a place called Zakama. It's in southern Chad. What we're after, though, is an ecosystem story. We don't even know there's an ivory crisis. But all we find while we're there is dead elephant after dead elephant. These guys are doing an investigation. And we switch our story to a different kind of story. There were 4,000 elephants when I was there in 2005. It dropped to 400. These lions are killing young elephants because the structure's broken. Normally, elephants would defend themselves against lions. And that's the, the herd of a 1,000 that became our signature photograph. But what I saw that evening is that there was one old matriarch leading all those families. And we realized this is not a natural history thing. This is fear. They've, they've got the wisest old lady to lead them out of the park where they can find forage. And she's, you know, she's supposed to be taking them to a safe place where there could be water. But there were machine guns waiting that night when they left the park. So 20 of these elephants were killed that night. What I want to make clear, though, the habitat is still perfectly intact. So there's not very many people out there. So it's not an elephant-human conflict over land. This is purely about ivory. And it's the gingerweed doing the killing in this part of Africa. And they're really good on horseback. So what came of this story, we raised a lot of money. We got an airplane for the park. Guards got better equipped. But still, these guys were just, they're just too good. But right now, the, the, it's turned around, and the, they've had the first babies born in the last few years in, in Zakama. You know, park guards are generally not soldiers. They're park guards. But here, they've had to become really incredible soldiers. And we colored this one elephant who we named Annie on the 23rd of May. She's given up information that's unbelievable. She tells us that when she leaves the park, she heads straight for this certain area of good vegetation. She also got out there and realized these rains are fake rains. They came too early. So she went back to the park and waited till the real rains had come. She runs all night. But she gets within a kilometer of a road and she waits all day till nightfall, and then she crosses the road, and then she goes on up. So she's telling us, hey, I, I'm thinking about this whole thing. I know where I'm going. I know what trees I'm looking for to eat, and I know where the roads are. 
So over about a three month period, Annie traveled over a thousand miles. That's an amazing statistic. But our caller stopped and we think, oh no, and she's been shot. When Mike went out to localize where she'd been shot at, they shot at his airplane. Now these elephants are essentially escorted when they leave by African parks. It's an organization that takes over war-torn parks and runs them like a business carefully. So th this is the bull that was shot within earshot of us. And probably 20, 30 bullets were put into this bull and they got the ivory back, but you know, we lost the elephant. And the bizarre thing is, I would say 80% of the killing that's happening now, the tusk might be that big, they're babies. You know, they're putting it in suitcases. If you're a Chinese worker in Africa, you get paid 300 bucks a month, you can turn it into 3,000. That's, you can't mark gold up like that. There's nothing else you can mark up like that. But these men are heroes. They risk their life every day. They, the, the bull elephants that live in Zakama, they knew where to stay. They stayed at park headquarters while this was going on. But uh, as I was going along, I had still never seen an, an elephant. You know, except that we're afraid. And everybody said, you need to go to with Ian Douglas Hamilton and save the elephants and go to Samburu where you can see safe, happy elephants and their families. So I spent a, a good bit of time over two years in Kenya with elephants where I had a translator, a young Samburu man that was the research assistant who could identify 600 different elephants on site. So I'm no longer running away. Oh, he's probably 15 years old and he's just having fun with it. Which camera? Which camera? Okay. And so you can, you know, they. I, you start seeing things. And what we would do, we wear the same clothing every day, same car. We don't approach them, and they come to us. All the barriers and all the decisions are made by the elephants. And I, I got started thinking about elephants in a very different way. This is a, a young male that wants to follow the winds and harass the girls, and they're standing guard saying, no, you're not going to follow us across this river. That's Babylon of the biblical towns. That's her, the big one, with her daughter, her daughter's daughter, and her daughter's daughter's daughter, all three newborns. So she's about 60. The 12 hours of daylight of these days was just unbelievable. And you just get into their world, and I started seeing that they know it's going to rain three days before it's going to rain. They, they seem to mourn the dead. They, oh, this is Saturn of the planets. And only two of those kids are hers. The others she's adopted. And she's a doting mother. She's, those planets are off somewhere else, and she's doting over these kids she's taking care of. She's guarding them while they play. Navajo of the American Indians. Four in the morning, elephants lay down in moonlight. This is a young boy that's taken over the mud hole and kicked the family out. Male elephants have to leave the family when they become sexually mature. So they end up kind of walking the earth alone, trying to find a buddy or somebody they played with when they were young. One of the things that I saw at Samburu that didn't become clear until recently in Tanzania, not only have their family group, there's clans. And so when I would see Babylon leave the park to head for rain clouds and she'd have these four other families with her, that was the clan. And they were going out to, to forage. Boone. Is 65 years old, and that's Maya Angelou and the poets just loving up on him. And there's no sex involved. He's just been away for a long time, and he's, he's 65 years old, so they're telling him how much they love him. It, it, so we just it's, it became very emotional, and I knew then that I had to do this book, so I started thinking about Earth to Sky. For me, it's about the elephant being so rooted to the earth but being so spiritual at the same time. And I, I feel this intensely. 
And she can walk away, but she's playing. So there's an elderly woman in Kenya. She's fifth generation Kenyan. And Daphne Sheldrick, probably 40 years ago, she adopted her first orphan elephant. And today, Daphne has this orphanage in Nairobi, and they, once they get bigger, they can go back to the wild in Sabo. These guys are two years old, and they should still be infants, but they're going to be the matriarchs of these six-month-olds. And that's, So when the orphans come in, they're immediately socialized with the, the other elephants who say to them, I know you've had a rough go, but these people are OK. Don't think that this is some kind of incredible success. It is successful because they become ambassadors, but most of the babies die. They're just too traumatized. They've they got to have all this love. And if they've, if they've had much time with wild elephants, they're just going to give up and die. But what I was amazed at is you know, all of these would have been under their mothers out there in Samburu, but they're taking care of these little babies. The men sleep with them, but they don't sleep with the same orphan every night, so they don't get imprinted, so they don't have this tragedy of getting homesick when some guy goes home on his vacation. It's an incredible process, and the blanket is the mother. They're almost blind. They can't really control things. They're wobbly, and they're touching that blanket. And this one died. And these guys get upset with every one of these deaths. They have an incredible emotional investment. And that's a two and a half year old. It takes 11 men to pick up a two and a half year old elephant. And it died the next day. But the cool part about when they go back to the wild, and this is where this comes full circle, is Northern Savo got shot out a long time ago. And the vegetation started to change because elephants weren't there anymore. It got closed up. It got hard. The herbivores all disappeared because the veg wasn't right. Elephants play an incredible role in the ecosystem. So they put the orphans back in northern Savo, and the wild elephants are out there, and they're like, hey, it's safe up north again. And they go north. Merka was found in a thicket, her mother dead, with that spear in her head up to that hand. And they thought, this elephant is never going to be able to deal with humans again. Well, she's been there about a year at this point, and we decided, well, we'll just show her the spear and see, but we'll do it very quietly. And the, and the whole maybe five minutes that I was making these pictures, she's touching that spear and touching the place where it came out of and touching it. And she didn't get upset. We were very respectful. But well, the amazing thing is that she is, knows the difference between good humans and bad humans, or however you want to put it. It's not that simple, but because the men that killed her mother were mad at the park because of some elephant issue in their gardens. Africans are generally afraid of elephants, not the pastoralist, but the, you know, the, the agriculturalist. These kids come from a, a town, a village that completely has elephant problems. And these are Savo elephants. And these kids were incredibly frightened, just shaking after they got out of the bus. And then Mazima came over and just disarmed them. And she just played. So they get milk every day. And they, they're going to stay dependent as long as they need milk. And then they, they eventually just go off and don't come back. But they form orphan groups. They're not going out and joining wild groups. They form their own herds, and then they go out. So back to northern Savo. These are adult orphans that have babies that come visit when they get poison arrows in them. The vet puts them down. They take the arrow out, and they go back out. They come in to have their babies because they feel safe back at the, the stockades. That's where the wild elephants come to drink, and he stays inside the electric fence in northern Savo. So when the orphans came, they literally opened up the veg, the herbivores came back, and now the predators are coming back. This is not some pie in the sky thing. These orphans have recolonized northern Savo. And the, another interesting thing about is when the, the babies are going to leave Nairobi, they put them on a truck. It's about a six hour drive. So that's early in the morning. Early in the morning, at the release, at the stockades, 
in northern Savo, the or ex-orphans, they call them, come and wait for the babies to get there. And they just go whack over them, trying to steal them. And they'll, they'll take them, and they go off and have them for a few days, and they're like, uh-oh, we can't give them milk. And they bring them back and get them back to the orphanage. So, you know, stuff that's unexplainable. So we, for five years, we've planned a story about lions. I wanted to go to the Mecca of wildlife, Serengeti. We needed to do a lion story. Lions are disappearing. They're, they're collapsing. The star of our story became this black-maned male lion who's called Sea Boy in the study. And female lions favor the black mane over the blonde mane or the slightly yellow mane or the different colors, but this is one badass lion. Science says that they can count. So if they hear three roars they, and there's five of them, they know they've got the other guys outnumbered and they go after them. Now he's not happy with the car. This is the, in this case, it's our first night with him. We're following him on his escapades and we're learning about lion mating. And what this is, is usually about two weeks every seven minutes. Think about that. And you, and you get bitten after every, every time. This is our first day with our pride, the Vumbi pride. First day. And they're starving. It's the dry season. The cubs are mangy. Everybody's starving. But at sunset, they all laid in a wheel. And they saw warthogs go into a hole. I don't know if you even saw it. One of them jumped over. The collared lady, they got this one out, and the collared lady just kept digging, and she got something to eat, the second one. But that's how big they are when we first get to know them. There's 14 cubs were born, five females. By the time we see them, there's nine surviving cubs. And eight got all the way to two years old, and that's what we're going to follow. And we just saw this incredible cooperation and care and we didn't know who was mother of who. and So this is about day three of them seeing our little robot car. They never, ever jumped at us, growled at us. They were just curious. Some of our night follows, we follow them all night with night vision and infrared, and they take us back to our camp where they destroy things in front, in front of our night vision. <laughs> Yeah. 
And Disney didn't tell us about this. I thought the male lion was the king of the beasts. Well, Seaboy started showing up. They knew he was the father and Hildora's partner. They're both the fathers of these cubs, so not a threat to kill them. But there wasn't enough food to go around. And Seaboy kept growling at the cubs. And that was the last time he growled at the cubs. These five females are really, and we just fell you know, completely in love with them. Whenever you see it really close, it's not me holding the camera, I assure you. This is an old female that's got worn out teeth. She's in the Barafu pride. We know that she's made it. We know she's going to have these cubs. So I start visiting the bush where she's at. That's the old lady's daughter with her first litter. She's a little bit further down the creek bed with her new cubs, her first litter. And she's just nervous that the cubs are getting too close to us. But this doesn't happen overnight. Her mother had the collar on, so we kept I kept checking the bush because we'd done the math of when her cubs should be born. And, and just in our roots of going there all the time, we run upon the daughter with tiny new fluff balls, and her mom had fluff balls. But as we're going through this, we know there's a set of males that are out there called the killers, two sets of brothers from the same pride. That's the pride. Kibumbu is there. Barafu is there. And Vumbi is over there. And this is where the killers are based. So when the killers took over Kibumbu, they killed those 10 cubs. Over days and months, they killed them. And then the next day, the Kibumbu females were mating with these guys. So they're now partnered up. This is the part about lion stuff that gets pretty weird. And then the, the Kibumbu females took the killers over to the Barafu pride and had them kill one of those females. Basically a hit contract hit, and that's what's playing out. But meanwhile, Vumbi is out, and nobody wants their territory. It's not a valuable territory. This, these Kibumbu and Barafu prides are in a riverbed, and that's exactly what the science says, that lion cooperation comes from real estate. But I was scared when I photographed the killers. They were no different than Seaboy, and this is just our only moment where we could ever see all four of them. They're rarely all four together, but they were together when they've been out on a raid. Seaboy appropriated that zebra carcass at dawn when we found him, and then he guarded it all day in the hot sun, and then that evening at dusk, he started eating it. And we last saw him dragging this toward a rock outcropping with 14 lions and 20 hyenas following. He's calling for his friend Hildor. He hasn't seen Hildor in a while. Hildor had a good night. A lion can be exploding with meat like that and the next day look like he hasn't eaten in a year. So they're partners. That's one of uh, the Vumbi cubs, females, just harassing Hildor. They, they kept him on his toes. So we're in our last trip of three long trips. And we think we're going to see the cubs grow up and then disperse. And that's the story keeps going. Well, the females started going into estrus. 
all of our Vumbi females, except for one, the elderly one, one after another went into estrus. And so we had two months of lion sex. That's Hildor, you know, with the cigarette. <laughs> That's why they sleep all the time. Now we did learn a lot. They, they do hunt with the dark moon. The full moon is virtually useless to them. And that's why the way we followed them was so important. We knew every meal they'd had. So we knew, OK, tonight it's dark. They're hungry. They're going to work tonight. But we never caused them to miss a meal. I just want you to understand, we were reverential about this business. So we could watch with thermal, which is a, anything that's warm-blooded glows. And we had night vision to move the car. We would never turn the lights on. And we would try to get there as fast as we could. That was our idea. And so my dream is to go back and work longer in the Serengeti. We had a little electric helicopter. It's quiet. It's not dangerous. So at night with the dark moon, we would do this kind of work. And the, the, the light, you see, it's an infrared spotlight that we have on our car. All of this stuff, the camera's mounted on the bumper of our Land Rover. This is the night that they killed this eland, which is well over a 1,000 pounds. And Seaboy immediately appropriated it. It came out of nowhere. He opened it up. He ate the back end out, opened up the insides, roared, stood up, and gave it to them. And 20 minutes later, it was gone. Again, how close are we? We're, I'm sitting like this, and they're underneath me. Their tails and stuff are underneath me. And that night, I think I'm holding the flashes, the infrared flashes with my feet. And one of the cubs who'd gotten all he wanted to eat came and reached inside and took the strobe off my foot and ran off with it. <laughs> and we never saw it again. Thank you.